Have you ever wondered what a quantum object truly is? You are not alone. Physicists have been pondering this question for a long time, from when we first identified the quantum world until right now. Physicists are still arguing about what the true interpretation of a quantum object is, and some recent measurements have helped to shed some light on this argument. While the mathematics of quantum mechanics allows us to make excellent predictions, it fails to definitively describe what a quantum object is. So the question remains, what is a quantum wave function? And if this wave function actually exists, what happens to it when we measure it? Let's discuss it. So what is a wave function? In the early days of quantum mechanics, Erwin Schrödinger wrote down his famous Schrödinger equation, which allowed us to calculate the probability of finding a quantum object in a given state by treating it as a wave function. But the understanding of what this wave function truly is remains up for debate. Some physicists think that this is a physical object, while others view it as a probability wave, which has no physical realization. These different interpretations have consequences for how we view reality, and scientists have just performed some measurements that will change how we view some of these interpretations. But more on that soon. Let's start with why we have interpretations. Let's take a single photon that goes through a beam splitter. When the photon goes through the beam splitter, it has a 50% chance of going to the right and a 50% chance of going straight through. And we know this to be true because we've measured it. But we only know this when the measurement is performed. Quantum mechanics tells us about everything that has happened up until the point of the measurement. It describes that when the photon goes through the beam splitter, it goes through in both directions, and that now there is a wave function that describes photons traveling along both paths simultaneously. Quantum mechanics then says, when a measurement is performed, the wave function collapses down to form a single state. Either the photon has gone straight through, or it's gone to the right. But here's the issue. What if these two measurement locations were really far away? Let's say that they were in completely different solar systems. Well, then just before the measurement, there would exist a wave function that spanned the entire space between two solar systems, which when measured would instantaneously collapse. This type of collapse would seem to break special relativity and the speed limit of light speed that it places on the universe, which really upset Einstein. And this is understandable. How can something that spans such a large distance instantaneously collapse? It doesn't quite make sense to us. And this is where some physicists came out and said the way we think about quantum mechanics is wrong and needs to be changed. So now we have all these different interpretations of quantum mechanics, but no idea which one is right. So what are some of these interpretations and how do they differ? There are plenty of different interpretations and people are very passionate about some of them. I'll only cover a few. The Copenhagen interpretation was one of the first interpretations to be thought of and is a brainchild of Niels Bohr and Wiener Heisenberg. In this interpretation, the wave function describes a probability of finding a system in a given state. During the evolution of the system, the wave function is continuous. That is, there is no abrupt changes in the wave function, as all well-behaved systems should be. But when there's a measurement, the wave function instantaneously collapses. Which is discontinuous? Not so nice. People in favor of the Copenhagen interpretation might say, that doesn't matter too much. To them, the wave function doesn't really matter that much. We can't ever measure the wave function, just a projection of it after we break it. So don't worry about it too much. Einstein said, no, 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 this isn't good enough. He really liked his theory of special relativity. Fair enough, I would too. And the wave function collapse would seem to violate this. Although there are good arguments as to why it doesn't. Either way, he called the wave function collapse spooky action at a distance and didn't like it. 
he proposed a different interpretation, where there must be some hidden variables that we don't know that describes the quantum system. This would change quantum mechanics from a probabilistic theory to a deterministic one. Although we can probably never access these hidden variables, so in reality, it would still remain probabilistic. Unfortunately though, the Bell test, which won the Nobel Prize in 2022, ruled out this possibility. I have a video about this Nobel Prize, so if you wanna know more, check that out. Now, technically, the Bell test ruled out local hidden variables. There is still the possibility that there are some non-local hidden variables, but that is for another discussion. Another interpretation that has captured the minds of many people is featured in countless science fiction books and movies and has ultimately led to a fierce debate about the implications of this interpretation on philosophy is the many worlds interpretation. It's easy to see why this is such an interesting interpretation. In the many worlds interpretation, it is suggested that there is an infinite number of universes and that every possibility is played out in one of these universes. This gets around the problem of the wave function collapse. Instead, there is just two universes that have branched off for the two possible solutions. Now, this interpretation does have some problems. Namely, it's inconsistent with probability. Instead of a probability of getting one state or the other, there is now a 100% chance of getting a given state for a given universe. Now, there are arguments to fix this problem where there's not just two universes, but enough to make up the probability distribution function that we measure. Now, while some scientists do believe this interpretation, they tend to think of these alternative universes as not actually real. But this is a modification of the original interpretation. Whether or not this interpretation is true remains to be seen. There are some suggestions of experiments that could tell the difference between the many worlds interpretation and others, but none of these have been realized yet. Now for the last interpretation I will talk about. This is an interesting one because we have just measured how true this interpretation is. One name that it is given is continuous spontaneous localization. In this interpretation, it is assumed that a given quantum system is constantly interacting with some unknown source. And it is this interaction that results in the wave function collapse. That is, that the interaction localizes the quantum state, which it does so continuously and spontaneously, thus the name. Now, it is not obvious what this type of interaction should be. It could be anything that is capable of interacting. Roger Penrose, who won the Nobel Prize for the discovery that black hole formation is a robust prediction of general relativity, proposed that maybe the source of this interaction was gravity itself. The idea behind this is quite interesting. Let's take a single quantum object and let it have a superposition of two different locations. Well, each of these positions has a mass and as such produces a local gravity. But the change in gravity at position one ends up affecting the gravity at position two and vice versa. As a result, each of the particles locations interact with the other one through their mutual gravity, which effectively makes the quantum objects measure themselves, eventually collapsing their own wave function through self interactions. The exciting thing about this interpretation is that it makes testable predictions, predictions that we are testing. If quantum particles really are interacting constantly in this manner, then these particles would be constantly localizing back and forth, making a zigzag pattern. If this was a charged particle, say an electron, then this would be a charge moving back and forth. And a charge moving back and forth produces an electromagnetic signal. If this is true, this would be a tiny signal and does require really advanced experimental equipment. In this case, it requires an extremely sensitive sensor that is located deep underground. Using a, this highly sensitive detector that is shielded from the outside in some cases by a literal mountain, scientists can probe these minute signals from this continuous, spontaneous localization. The experiments have gone very well, but they haven't detected a signal when the theory would suggest that they should have. 
Now, of course, with any theory like this, you can always change some parameters and just say the experiment wasn't sensitive enough yet. But this is basically the name of the game for particle physics these days. Make a prediction about a particle, then perform measurements to place bounds on the quality of that particle if it could still exist. So this is quite normal. In the end, what does this mean in the long run for quantum interpretations? The space that allows continuous spontaneous localization to be true is getting smaller. So maybe we will be able to completely exclude this interpretation altogether very soon. But this still leaves many interpretations that have no way to be tested yet. So we will be stuck with multiple interpretations for a while now. Ultimately, understanding what makes up particles and how quantum mechanics is consistent with this is extremely important. And it turns out that we are still learning more about what even makes up a proton. Check out this video if you want to learn more about what we currently consider a proton to be, because it's recently changed.